שלום פרופסור קורב. שלום, thank you so much for your invitation. I understand we... that the first question to me is about the conflict in Ukraine. Yes, please. Uh, I, I, I believe in order to understand any military situation, we always need to ask some basic questions like um, why? why? Why this conflict actually has started? Uh, what uh, someone wants to achieve? The second question, how? How someone can achieve this? And finally, what will happen as a result of this conflict? And I think when we analyze the Russian side, when we analyze the reasons for the Russians to enter into the war, then we can find uh, relatively easily the answers to all those questions. Um, well, we can analyze uh, the war in Ukraine from the rallies perspective, and there is a famous international relations scholar whose name is John Meisheimer, who claims, and I believe this is a correct inter interpretation, that the main reason for the war in Ukraine is the expansion of, of NATO, that, uh, that this expansion of NATO constitutes an existential threat for Russia. Russia has worn uh, uh, NATO many times since 2008 that an expansion of NATO will in the end result in a conflict. Uh, and uh, this conflict has actually happened. But usually, but usually for any war, one reason is not enough. Uh, it must be combined reason. And realists in general, they, they usually address only one dimension of international relations, which is international system. And from this point of view, indeed expansion of NATO, which means changing of the balance of power can lead to a conflict. But I believe that in this particular war, you need also to take into consideration domestic aspects, domestic aspects of politics. And we need to remember that since 2014, we actually had war in Donbas. And in a sense, this war is an extension of the war in Do Donbas. Now, why this war in Donbas happened? Why? What was the reason? The reason, to make it simple, can be described as the changing of the language law in Ukraine. Um, we know that in 2014, there was Maidan, there was a change of government, and as a result of this, President Yanukovych had to leave. And on 20, on, he leaves basically on the 22nd of, 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 um, um, of, of January uh, 2014. And the next day, just next day, there's also a change in the language law in Ukraine which means Russian minority in Ukraine can no longer use um, lang Russian language as uh, for everyday business, basically. And this has even been stronger emphasized in another language change, which occurs in 2019. And of course, this is causing a dissatisfaction, a dissatisfaction among Russian speakers in Ukraine. We need to understand that in Ukraine, about 30% of citizens speak Russians. They do not necessarily associate themselves with Russia. Nevertheless, they have a cultural attachment to the language they are using. And this is causing dissatisfaction. This is why we have the developments, uh, the events which happened in Crimea, um, but also in Donbass. And in the end, we have a civil war, a civil war which 
which which which which occurs in Ukraine, and um, their attempts to to end this conflict, uh, their so-called uh, Minsk agreements, but they do not work. They do not work. And um, in general, President uh, Poroshenko, who is just replacing Yanukovych, he does not really want to solve the problem. The conflict continues. And uh, in the very end, uh, it leads to the war. It leads to the war, which is the current war. So I would say that those are the two main reasons. But there is one more reason, which is also important, if we really want to understand what is going on in Ukraine. Now, Ukraine has a problem with its history. Namely, on the one hand, Ukraine claims we are an old country going back to many centuries ago. But in fact, they cannot really build any, um, any historical narrative which would really go very far back. Like for example, in Poland, we don't have problems. We know we go back with our history to nine, 966, which means more than 1000 years. We have a number of kings who ruled Poland. We had many historical events related to our history. We do not need to construct our history because we have indeed a very well documented and long history. In Ukraine, there is a problem. There is a problem, and President Yanukovych started, in a sense, to construct Ukrainian history. And I believe that he has started to construct Ukrainian history with a wrong example, because certainly to refer in history to some fascist traditions. I think is very uh, a very mistaken policy. Um, President Viktor Yanukovych, uh, he this one who um, uh, uh, sorry Professor Viktor Yushchenko, who was before Viktor Yanukovych, he's actually introducing Bandera. He's introducing Bandera as a national hero. But who was Bandera? He was the leader of uh, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists during the Second World War and early. And Bandera's troops are responsible for genocide, uh, genocide on, on, on the Poles, but also of the Jews. So especially Poles and the Jews were victims of the organization of uh, Ukrainian nationalists, which is op in operation from around 1930, and then commits its worst crimes during 1942 and 43. And the victims are, ma are mainly Jewish people and Polish people. So to build, to build a national history on such example, I think is wrong and acceptable policy. And now this policy is actually related to the language policy as well, because if Ukraine was actually not ruled by nationalists, they would not push on the language uh, um, law change. They will simply, like for example, in Switzerland, we have French language, German language, Italian language, uh, and uh, you can have a country in which different languages are used. But if, if you push just for one language and you have around 30% of people who do not speak the language, more than 30% of Ukrainians actually do not use Ukrainian, if you make such uh, push, and if you try to execute in a kind of a forceful way, in the end, you will have an opposition. So you see those three reasons, in a sense, well, those two reasons are related. And then in addition, you have the reason 
of NATO expansion. So now we understand what are the reasons on the Russian side, because from the Russian side, all those free developments are not acceptable. How do they want it to achieve this? I think the Russians, they actually thought initially that the response from, uh, fr uh, from the local populations will be more positive than it actually was. Initially, they were, initially, I believe, they were not really prepared for, for a war in Ukraine. Initially, they were only prepared for a special operation. They just thought that this Russian speaking minority in Ukraine will actually support them more. And this is why they were initially losing a lot of the soldiers. Because now, if you are miscalculating, if you think that you will receive a support from local population and you will and um, you actually don't receive such support, then you are losing your soldiers. So initially, initially, uh, uh, Russians will lose quite, quite a lot of, of their soldiers. This was a miscalculation. But uh, politics is always a dynamic phenomenon. We need to understand that there are what I will call mistakes on a part, primary on a part of the Ukraine. Because again, even if you have those uh, Russian speaking people in Ukraine, it does not mean that they will support Russia. If you will treat them in a proper way, they will actually prefer to be part of, of Ukraine with the perspective of Ukraine joining European Union. So I would say most Ukrainians, they're actually more pro-Europeans than pro-Russians. Nevertheless, those language laws and the fact that the extreme right will start to dominate Ukrainian political spectrum has caused an alienation, an alienation among the Russian speaking Ukrainians. So you see the situation is dynamic. And it seems to me that today, actually, the Russian speaking Ukrainians, they give more support to the Russian army than it was at the beginning of the war. And of course, Ukraine today is losing this war totally. So there is now, Russians have changed their way, their tactics. Ukraine is just losing war. There, there are about 1,000 people in this war who die per day. And some people say now it is about 10 Ukrainian soldiers to one Russian. So. In a sense, Russia has learned from the whole situation, they changed their military tactics, but also the Russian speaking Ukrainians have changed their attitudes. Why? Why? Because of the behavior of some Ukrainian troops, especially those very nationalistic troops on a part on a, on a part where most Ukrainians speak Russians. For example, Azov Battalion. Azov Battalion. Now, this Azov Battalion, well, I cannot prove this. Nevertheless, there are many opinions that they were actually committed crimes in Mariupol. Now, why they have committed crimes? Because of the disregard for the Russians, many of those very nationalistic Ukrainians, in a sense, regard Russians as subhumans. And it does not only refer to the Russians who live in Russia, but in a sense, they treat to some degree as subhumans, their own citizens who speak Russians. And unfortunately, unfortunately, I say unfortunately because I always wish people the best, this has resulted in a situation like this. Many Russian, many Russian speaker Ukrainians are being forced to army. They don't want to fight anymore. Very often they are just put in a place where they cannot, in a 
in fact, do anything valuable from a military point of view. So their units are destroyed by the Russians very quickly. They are not properly armed. But if you have these messages coming through your society that your people are being forcefully uh, forced into military, that they are not properly equipped, that they are sent to areas where they will be destroyed, of course, such messages will, will, will actually reach rich people. So I believe now on the Ukrainian parts, uh, which are populated by the Russian speakers, there is a greater and greater dissatisfaction actually with Ukrainian government. And those people who are actually pro-European uh, pro -pro and pro-European Union ch are changing their attitudes. They are more and more sympathetic towards the Russian side. So in a sense, what would be the conclusion? In normal conditions, in normal conditions, Ukraine has no chance anymore to win this war. Um, and now let us reverse this question and let us now ask the Ukrainian side again the same questions. What do we want to achieve? How do we want to achieve? And what will be the result? Now, from a Russian point of view, those questions could be precisely answered. Calculation of the military forces would lead to a potential victory. And the result would be to take from the Ukraine, at least take from the Ukraine some areas which are populated by the Russian speaking population. So from the point of view of Russia, all those answers can be, and all those questions can be answered in a clear way. But I believe if we now ask those questions from Ukrainian side, we don't have any clear answers at all. Because what, what do we want to achieve? President Zelensky said this many times. We want just to regain Crimea, all the territories occupied by Russia, or even we want to regain all territories which we regard as ethnically Ukrainian territories, which would even go beyond the borders of today's Ukraine. Now, we can always dream about something, but, and this is in a sense like a dream, because then there is a question, how do you want to achieve this? How can you achieve this if the uh, Ukrainian army is much smaller, much weaker, and now it is, I would say, already half destroyed. And the claims and the claims are repeated again and again. We just want to take back Crimea, we want to, to, to remove the occupants, but how? How if you have no possibilities? Now, even if the West, even if NATO sends Ukrainians, the weapons, still it does not, if to, to operate modern military equipment, you need to have skills. Those skills sometimes take one or two or three years to, 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 to develop. You cannot just take someone on the street, let's say like it has happened right now, they just take young people very often on the street, they force them to military, and then ask them to operate uh, a gun uh, or a tank. It takes long time, long time to educate the people. So even if the, if the NATO is now sending Ukrainians the weapons, and by the way, only 30% of them is reaching the army, someone 70% is disappearing, which is another big question. What is happening with with all this equipment. There is a great corruption as well. Even assuming that NATO would continue, would continue with sending weapons, this war can simply not be won. There is no possibility of winning the war because you need to have trained, trained people to operate Western military 
equipment. And without this equipment, you cannot really win. You have smaller forces. These forces are already demoralized to some degree. Not all units are ready to fight. And then the result, the result, what will, uh, what will be the result? Now, the result in, in, in today's situation, because there are some suggestions which are also coming from the Western media, Ukraine should fight to the last soldiers. But the result would be the last soldiers. The result would be annihilation of the whole country. So if I analyze this war from two, two perspectives, I don't see any reason why it is being continued. Um, but perhaps there are also reasons which are not military or not political, which means if this war cannot be won, and if this and, and information about this war can be relatively easy to obtain, if you look at independent sources, if you study at different sources, then you can easily come to conclusion that this war cannot be war won and it is basically senseless. So why do we actually prolong this? And of course, this is not only Ukraine. Those are also American interests, NATO interests, and other interests. So this is a big question. Why a war, which is a disaster, which is a human tragedy, in which around 1,000 young people die per day, is being continued, and what will be the result? Now, there are some also very dangerous uh, events related to the war. Like recently we had heard that Ukrainians have started to, um, to, uh, to hit some installations at the atomic um, facilities in Zaporozhye atomic uh, plant. Why do they do this now? Another question, why do they still hit Donbass? They have used some of the NATO equipment actually to hit uh, Donbass. And I would say 80% of the targets were civilian targets. Uh, so why do they do this? Uh, why they are using uh, NATO's equipment for, for killing civilians? And why they are now hitting this atomic uh, atomic uh, uh, plant in Zaporozhye. And I believe the answer is because they have no idea what to do. Because if you don't have a stra strategy, Russians have clear war strategy. Ukrainians have no idea what to do in this war. The, as I sometimes see videos with, uh, with Ukrainian soldiers, they have only one idea, which is killing Russians. They have no strategic plans. So I believe this war is a disaster, but the disaster is not only for Ukraine. This war affects us. This is not only Ukraine. This is not only Europe. We are now, we have now entered in a very dangerous, very dangerous war situation. So, well, uh, uh, the only thing I can add, I, I am an author of two peace proposals. What, first one was for Korea. This was in 2009. And second one was actually for Israel. And this was published in 2019 in the Jerusalem Post. So in a sense, uh, I believe that we should rather build, build peace whenever we can we can we can we we should establish if we can more harmonious better relationships between states between people and i believe this conflict is a complete opposite and um, on 21st of june myself and a few professors in poland we had we we signed kind of a peace statement we 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 called for peace in ukraine so this is now my third peace initiative. First was Korea, second Israel, third one is this conflict. And uh, I would say the response of the most of Polish of press in Poland was negative. So um, why do we now develop such war attitude when people who actually say, listen, 
this world does not make any sense. It does not lead us to anywhere except that we are all uh, in, in place in increasingly dangerous uh, international environment. Uh, uh, why, why the voices of people who in, in fact try to promote peace, not only for Ukraine, but also for Israel and early for Korea, why those voices are in a sense weak and not promoted? Uh, Professor, I have a question. Maybe you can speak about the dangers to Poland from the war on Ukraine. Now, they, again, we can analyze this war from different perspectives, from different perspectives. We can also analyze this war from American perspective. For Amer you know, all those people who, who propose, who propose, let us fight this war to the last Ukrainian, are in fact not acting for the benefit of Ukraine. But what, because what would be the benefit for Ukraine to, to fight this war to the last soldiers. Now, let us imagine such situation. Indeed, there are no more people to fight this war in Ukraine because all those military units are completely destroyed. And this can already happen in, in a few months, I believe. Uh, um, even if they are now trying to, to build uh, forces uh, um, by enlisting uh, new people, I believe uh, everything goes into this direction that Ukrainian uh, armed forces will be completely destroyed in a few months now. Then if, if, if Ukrainian forces are destroyed, then perhaps we can look for another country which could eventually perform this work. And this work is basically to weaken Russia. I don't see any, again, we can ask, why would United States promote war in Ukraine? Now, for, I, I would say that probably only for one reason, to weaken R Russia. And, and this, is also, this idea is also expressed by some American officials, uh, to weaken Russia, to, to make uh, Russia bleed. Now, first of all, this is a completely senseless idea because it actually brings Russia closer to China. And uh, if United States wants to avoid a challenge, the greatest challenge for United States is actually not Russia, but China. And to, may, uh, to contribute to a greater um, cooperation between Russia uh, and China is actually a policy mistake. But let's say someone just follows this idea to weaken Russia. So next country, the next country to be used to weaken Russia is actually Poland. And in Poland today, we have a lot of war propaganda. And this is why when I and few professors, and some of them are also specialists in international relations, have declared, uh, have made the statement peace for Ukraine, we were basically attacked by most media. So most media would not be sympathetic to the idea of peace. Why? Because there is now this kind of a propaganda, a, a very strong anti-Russian propaganda in Poland. And uh, well, there are some, some politicians who even suggest that Poland should enter this war. Um, so, and as you, as you may know, Poland has given 250 tanks, 250 tanks, which was actually most of the tanks Poland had to Ukraine for free, for nothing, for nothing. Now, also our, uh, um, uh, our fighters, our, our, our fighter aircrafts, I believe this was about 20 or 25, were given to, to Ukraine. Now, most of the tanks which Poland has given and most of the aircraft has already been destroyed, has already been destroyed. Now, uh, you can see also um, people in Israel should, although we, in a sense, uh, uh, were, were so close, closely related to each other for many centuries, 
I believe we still don't fully understand each other. So uh, also let me just explain something. Look, look at Poland's attitude. We are giving for free, for nothing, 250 tanks. And we are giving for nothing, let's say 20 aircraft. And we are hosting uh, almost four, 4 million Ukrainian refugees. Everything is for free. Those Polish citizens who host, who host Ukrainians actually receive some um, stipend from the Polish government. So in fact, they don't live in any refugee camps. They are mostly hosted by uh, in Polish houses, by families in other places. So we do so much for the Ukraine in a sense as a, as a gift. We are givers. And this is one important feature of, of Poland's character, which, which perhaps people in, in Israel should learn more about. We are not as calculating, as calculating, let's say, as, as people in the UK or in the United States, because everything, all the military help which goes from the United States is not a gift. In fact, uh, all those uh, billions, all those billions of dollars which are given by Biden, um, uh, Ukraine will need to return. This is just like a loan, long military loan for Ukraine. It is perhaps a loan on good conditions of repayments. Never there is, there is a loan. So you see, there is a difference between our attitudes, which in a sense is like giving, um, understanding Ukraine, that Ukrainians are in difficult situation. They need to be helped at this very moment. And this calculating attitude, which is related to selling weapons. Now, if this is selling, then of course you earn, you earn from war. So the first aspect of the conflict from the American side is, this is another, uh, another reason for making profits. You see, so this attitude of United States um, cannot be described as fully objective because if you are making profits on war, you are not a disinterested individual. And another, another thing which I already mentioned is you want to weaken Russia. You want to weaken Russia. You, um, in a sense, potentially aim to a situation in which Russia will be destroyed. But I believe, again, this is a completely wrong approach because you see, there is a very good book which was written once by Zbigniew Brzeziński. Maybe some of you have heard his name. His, yes. uh, the book uh, title is The Second Chance. The Second Chance. Zbigniew Brzeziński was, has a Polish origin. He was advisor uh, to President Carter. And he wrote the book Second Chance. And the second chance refers to the chance of the United States to be a world leader. A world leader. United States had the chance to be a world leader after 1989, after 1989. In a sense, after 1989, uh, after the Berlin Wall falls, many countries in the world would, uh, in a sense, be willing to accept American leadership, American leadership. So this was a great chance for United States to become a world leader. But now, how do you become a world leader? By benevolent action. So like giving thanks to Ukraine, in a sense, is a Poland's benevolent action. You want to serve others in, in times of, of war or times of crisis. So um, world leadership should always be benevolent, which means helping helping in different situations. Unfortunately, very soon, and this is what is uh, what Brzeziński says in this book, United States has started to pursue its policies, which were not really benevolent. 
which were in a sense acting for the U.S. interest. Uh, the interest would be defined in a different way in Iraq and in Ukraine. Now, I have a question. Was it interesting what I said? Was it interesting for you? I think uh, that it was very interesting. Now, uh, of course, when I said uh, my my perspective is maybe different from <laughs> from average uh, main media. Nevertheless, you know, I can always answer additional questions, and also I I believe it would be good to speak a little bit more about. Poland's uh, Israeli relationships. You see, I already described something what I have done. I have proposed also a peace for Israel. I, I made a peace proposal. It would be also interesting to speak about this. You know what I have done, and most of my articles, most of the of the articles which I have written in Jerusalem Post, the aim was actually to improve relationships between Poland and and Israel, because I believe we can both benefit. And my general approach uh, to the world is, I would, I would like to live in a peaceful world. Uh, this what now happens among us in this world, I believe uh, does not really lead us to a good direction. We will not benefit by, by, by any wo world conflict. Uh, it does not make any sense. I think there are many problems uh, which we have right now, of course, problems from different areas, but there are other ways to solve those problems. We don't need to enter into conflicts. And what we do, uh, our policies should also be based on sound knowledge of a given situation. For example, I believe that from both Poland's and Israeli side, it is not acceptable that those fascist uh, uh, traditions are being renewed in Ukraine. I think this is totally unacceptable. And Ukraine has to learn that if they would go into this direction, they will lose an international support. Because, you see, uh, what if Ukraine would win and it would become a stronger country with all those traditions which are related to committing genocide during the Second World War, you know. So, in a sense, um, those are, I would say, mistakes. Maybe this is related to Ukrainian history. But um, I believe that we in Poland and in Israel should stay firmly with certain values. And, and one value which can unite us, we should always be against any Nazi revival, any fascist revival, because this is what I said in one of my articles in Jerusalem Post, we were both victims. We were both victims. And um, of course, uh, the, the Jewish people suffered more because it was a smaller community. It is always easier to destroy uh, smaller communities. The Nazi Germans, they, they would primarily have initially the Jews as their targets. But ultimately, it was also uh, people in Poland uh, who would be the targets. So it is in our interest. And those are certain things which can actually unite our countries, that we should stand for certain values. We should not allow for any Nazi or fascist revival in the world. We also should depend, de defend our independence. I think for the Jewish people and for the Polish people to live in independent countries is very important. So you see on those common things and in addition on better understanding, because I think there is no sufficient understanding of what is actually Poland's soul. Uh, people don't understand this fully, even if we lived for so many hundreds of years together. I think with us is Adam Feder. I, I think Adam is a good person because I think he has an understanding what is um, Jewish soul and a Polish soul. You know, he even if he was a young child when he had to leave Poland, 
this was enough for him to understand, to understand. So if you understand, then you become a little bit more sympathetic towards Polish people because you find that there are more common things which can unite us, which can actually make us co to cooperate for our benefits, but also for the benefit of the world. We actually want to live in a peaceful world, in a world which can develop and not in this world which goes into a disaster. We agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are many problems, of course. Uh, and uh, one of them is not uh, what United States uh, uh, plans, but what uh, Putin plan. And some people think that he wants uh, to renew the Soviet empire. And if it is true, it is also a problem for Poland. But uh, Russia does not have the power to do this, even if they wanted. You see, Russia is only 140 millions. You know, Turkey is 90 millions, you know. So I think in 20 years, the population of Turkey will be greater than the population of Russia. So we need to calculate forces. This is what political realism is about. Russia has uh, demographic problems. It has a declining population. Um, it has only 140 million citizens. Russia cannot attack NATO. Russia can only defend itself, and it does right now. So I don't believe in any Russian invasion of Poland. I don't believe in this. Uh, I think it has no grounds when we calculate forces. When we calculate forces, it has no ground. And also, I don't think that in Russia you find any dangerous ideology. Much more dangerous ideology is now in Ukraine. This is a revival of fascism. And this is what we should really, we should not really conceal this. We should be open about speaking about this because we don't want, even if, if, if Ukraine is not as large as Russia, we don't want to have any country which is promoting, which, 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 which is promoting such ideas. And um, Bandera, who, who was a leader of the Ukrainian extreme right, Ukrainian nationalist movement is now proclaimed national hero in Ukraine. From the perspective of someone who has suffered uh, from, um, from... By the way, also, also Khmelnytsky. Khmelnytsky is something different. Khmelnytsky is an old history. You know, Khmelnytsky was to some degree also a Polish nobleman. You know, this was from the old times. Khmelnytsky committed a mistake because at certain point he thought uh, that it would be better for him to enter into union with Russia. And this was a great mistake. He was fighting at certain point against Poland. But uh, in a sense, he was, I would say, politically ambitious person, politically ambitious. I don't think that he was doing this for, for Ukrainians. He was doing it primarily for himself. He just wanted to become a local leader. But um, he made a terrible mistake because as a Polish nobleman, could be, he could be respected. But uh, as he turned against Poland and in the end he went to sign an agreement with Russia, he actually lost everything. He lost everything. So you see, this is... Uh, uh, this, uh, I, I don't really know why in Ukraine Khmelnytsky is being um, promoted as well, because this is another leader who, who basically conducted a mistaken policy, which ended in, in disaster for, for Ukraine. So, um, but you see, they, are, they have problems with their history. They, um, this, this is a problem. This is an ideological problem in, in Ukraine. And um, those two heroes, Khmelnytsky and Bandera, they are both anti-Polish. And now Ukraine receives so much help from Polish people, you know, we are just showing our goodness, but they are taking without giving. Uh, 
at this point, they should, in a sense, revise their thinking about history. How can you take from someone and not to give? Uh, but anyway, uh, we will not solve this problem here, but uh, uh, the most important is we should only promote positive ideas. Also in history, we should not build on any negative ideas because we cannot really build on such ideas our countries. By the way, why uh, Finland uh, wants to enter the NATO? I, afraid, I don't know. <laughs> they're afraid from Russia and maybe all, all, also Shvedia. Well, uh, fear, this is already Thucydides. In 2,500 years ago, Thucydides, he was describing fear as main cause of wars. But you see, in today's world, we should be so advanced, which means if we are afraid of something, we should be only rationally afraid, which means if there are real reasons, if there are real reasons, we should be afraid. Personally, I don't think that Sweden or Finland should, should, should feel endangered. I don't really think that they should be endangered. But you see, with Ukraine, it is a completely different situation. I mentioned, I mentioned why. Uh, if you have the revival of the radical fire, far uh, right, if, if, if this radical far right is making changes into language laws, if those changes are leading to uh, prosecution of language minorities, and if, in addition, you have Ukraine, which is much more, much larger country and much more powerful in terms of population, to be a member of, of, of NATO, this can make Russia afraid. And in the end, it can lead Russia to action. So I think we can, of course, consider fear, but at the same time, we should always think in rational terms about fear, because fear without reason is not really much worth. We can be afraid, but uh, are we rightly afraid? We should always calculate forces. Our meeting uh, will uh, put it in the YouTube. Maybe it will help you to become our ambassador here. <laughs> then you will meet in person. <laughs>